Good morning and thank you. Uh, definitely appreciate everybody uh, showing up, not only here today, but also uh, for the week. I know uh, taking that time commitment uh, in everything we do is, is hard to do, but I think it's important that we spend the time together, meet up, discuss, learn from each other. Um, I'm going to walk through a presentation that um, Sam Ramji and I did at EMC World. And uh, if any of you have gone to EMC World, a little bit different audience, you know, predominantly focused on IT operators, uh, system administrators. Um, and many of you may know some of this material, but I'm sure uh, each and every day we have new technologies in this new world to choose from. And so this is to give you additional insights uh, into why you made the right decision about platforms and also to, to uh, you know, give you additional information and ammunition as you go about your daily business within your own organizations. Um, so the essence of the uh, discussion was really around enterprise DevOps, uh, modern software technology. Uh, Matt Cowger, who's uh, here today uh, from EMC, he uh, generated this new uh, track to focus on code and modern operations. And it was really about the DevOps movement. And what we see across our enterprise customers is that this movement is accelerating enterprise innovation. And as many of you know, it's a different, different world. It's a different model. In fact, many things are different. And dev and ops trade-offs are made continually. Um, so the focus of this discussion was really about platforms. De definitely, y this audience knows why uh, you're making the right decision. But again, um, these decisions need a very holistic view about um, you know, making decisions for, that are appropriate for your business. And making those right decisions can help you and your business uh, make uh, the following choices between innovation velocity and uh, governance risk and compliance requirements. So um, the, the, the audience at EMC World, again, a little bit different you know, a lot of, a lot of people uh, understand DevOps. In fact, that F was supposed to be an H, so um, it's what the heck is DevOps. Um, but it's important to note that DevOps is not a thing, right? It's not a job spec, it's not a title, it's not a process. It's not, I, I can't, like, say, you know, can I have two scoops of DevOps and sprinkle in a little bit of hybrid cloud? You can't buy it, right? What it is, it's a movement. And at EMC, we're actually practicing this uh, movement, if you will, uh, each and every day at the EMC Dojo. And that movement is based uh, and, and built by practitioners for practitioners, and it really incorporates a lot of the discussion you just heard about continuous integration and deployment, allowing us to focus on uh, the circle of software, as ANSI calls it, to develop more reliable, uh, faster uh, innovation uh, for our businesses. And it is very different. You know, I can drill down into a lot of the difference. I spent most of my career uh, on this side, on the traditional side of development. Um, in fact, I've been at two companies, one startup, one large company. The startup, I was the fifth engineer. Uh, there was 50 people worldwide. Today, that company is over 60,000 people. It's known as EMC uh, Corporation. Um, and predominantly, I've spent my, my entire career uh, in, in development, and there are night and day differences. It is a difference between black and white and color TV from everything. Um, there are some similarities between how we used to do development, um, but you know, as we kind of drill down into that, what's important for EMC and what we build our, uh, our business around is really around the bottom, around infrastructure and reliability, availability, serviceability. When we look at this new world, that capability is built differently. It's not necessarily provided by the infrastructure, more around the platform and uh, the application. Um, but what's really different is the, the principles of focusing on adoption uh, by customers. And that's the iteration of the build, measure, learn cycle, and to be able to iterate with passion and urgency. But like prior movements in lean and agile, if this doesn't take its uh, course, this movement doesn't take its course all across the business, um, then we haven't made our mark, right? To do uh, continuous integration and deployment, to build MVP is a hard thing for businesses to do, 
right? It's a different concept. Everybody wants everything day one, but that's not how we work today. Um, so I think it's important as we go forward to make sure that we're educational in each of our businesses about the whole business movement around DevOps as well. And I'm sure many of you know there's a lot of statistics on this stuff, right? You know, increased collaboration, 35% increase in new software and services, a 46% reduction in spending. Um, but it's really important that I remind you um, that exactly 94.1% of all statistics are inaccurate. It's true. It is. <laughs> I actually said that in a meeting, and, and, and a guy goes, what was that, 94.1%? I said, no, it's 93.7. He goes, OK, 93.7. Um, but the, the real benefit of a DevOps movement or practice is really about hitting customer engagement, adoption, and satisfaction, and to be able to pivot faster, that fast feedback cycle. I have built many products with many different technologies and features that were not adopted. Right, the traditional uh, water scrum fall process where we've got 18 to 24 month development cycles and we get it out there and the customer says, that's just not what I wanted. Right, so you know, getting that concept across to our business to say, look, MVP is good enough, we will have enough uh, to get early feedback on that and we can pivot instead of predictably hitting our target, we can pivot to what the customer wants sooner. So, you know, at, at EMC World, um, you know, and we kind of leveraged this study that was done by uh, RightScale. Um, the data uh, came from uh, ClearPath. But, um, you know, across the industry, as we look at DevOps adoption, the good news is around two-thirds today, or at least in 2015, are adopting a DevOps practice. Um, looking at using cloud today, uh, the numbers are higher, which is great. You know, five, six, seven years ago, people were, you know, cloud was kind of a dream. Today, 93% of the respondents are using a cloud today. And out of those respondents, 82% are using a multi-cloud, all right? Whether, and it's predominantly hybrid-based, so the bulk of that is a hybrid cloud. Uh, but some are deploying a strategy around multi-private, multi-public. Um, but, you know, when we look at the number of clouds, it's not one cloud. There are many clouds out there. So here's a challenge, and here's a challenge we face as users, as an industry, is what about platform, right? As we look at cloud computing architectures, what percentage of people out there in the world are adopting platform? 16% say that they have a platform strategy, and that's problematic. Um, you know, when we look at the complexity and even the talk uh, we just went through, not having a platform to do what we need to do in terms of digital transformation is very, very difficult. And there are challenges. You know, um, when the, we look at the DevOps model, this is what, I, by the way, I call pair peddling. If you practice pair peddling. Um, but, when, you know, De DevOps is not a panacea for everything. Right, so uh, you know, having a DevOps practice, there are there are constraints and different value systems between what developers value and what operators value. Right, this model puts them closer together, puts us closer together, um, but we do have different value systems. For developers, it's important for us to have agility and speed and ease of use and you know new tools, uh, you know, uh, and to also have a have our customers have a love affair with the software that we produce. But as operators, it gets back to you know, traditional IT ops. Those value systems haven't changed, right? You know, IT, you know, people still get paid on things related to governance, risk, compliance, security, cost, availability, predictability. Um, and then kind of looking forward, I ask this question a lot you know, to those that are implementing a, a DevOps practice is, if we run the movie five years forward, what does it look like? You know, is DevOps going to be, you know, this movement going to be just restricted to new applications? Or will this take over in terms of bimodal IT? What about rewriting applications? Is that going to be mode one? Or are we going to see mode two or, or, or you know, kind of the DevOps movement start to move all across? So will this green, blue, green picture in the future five years from now 
uh, be much greener than it is for all applications, not just net new, but what about rewrite and replatform? Right? And, and that's top of mind for CIOs across the industry, is that many know that they need to invest in the bimodal IT to capture this wave of innovation and disruption that software is occurring in the market, um, but they know it's not forever, right? It, it's temporal as we look at it. So the benefits, as many of you know, you know in terms of Cloud Foundry, is the, the beauty of abstraction, right? As a developer, simply CF push my app, as an operator, I can Bosch deploy my service. So where the, 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 the beauty is really in the abstraction layers of the platform, it's also a challenge, right? As we look at the operational characteristics, abstraction levels create less direct control of the infrastructure and the service level agreements underneath of it. When I do a CF push of my app, how do I know I'm going to get that predictability? How, how am I going to know that my governance, risk, and compliance requirements are, are met? So that's where the importance of platform comes in, right? And Cloud Foundry being, uh, in our collective opinion, one of the most important. So ClearPath did additional work around this to, to survey uh, users and evaluators, right? So what's in blue is the uh, people that are using technology today. And it, what's in red are people that are evaluating that technology. And they asked those users a number of questions. And what the findings were is that, look, in the future, it's not just a container-only world, right? A lot of people think containers are, you know, containers are, are, are great, but virtual machines and other uh, packaging concepts will exist, coexist in the future. Um, trying to do this without a platform is next to impossible. Right? So you look at the practitioners in this model, uh, they know, you know, trying to do it and go it alone. In certain environments, it may be easy to do, um, you know, smaller scale. Doing it mid to large enterprise scale, it's, it, it's a heck of a lot of hardware. Trying to control your own hardware without a platform is even more challenging. And the container cluster managers and orchestrators are not good enough. Right? So Kubernetes, Chef, Puppet, they do very good for certain environments, but they don't cover the spectrum of what IT practitioners uh, need in their environment. So the good news is there's a lot of choices out there with platforms. In fact, there are over 70 platform vendors out there on the planet today, and that community's been growing. Most of them are in production. You know, mo a lot of the industry doesn't understand this. They think platform... Uh, technology is kind of nascent. It's not. You know, many of them have been out there for, for years in production environments deploying production workloads. You know, most of them are polyglot, and there's hundreds of services uh, that are being offered on these platforms, and that conti continues to grow. So that's the good news. The bad news is the same thing. There's too many choices, right? And you will be faced with more and more of those each and every day. In, in, the, in this new world, technology, uh, the investment and, you know, even VCs and, and uh, you know, uh, equity is being poured into this community. So we will see more of this a year from now, two years from now. Um, there are too many choices. Um, and there's a lot of things that go into the choice of a platform. It's not just, hey, who does the just best job of orchestra orchestrating my containers? Right? It gets into a number of things, you know, in terms of you know, the backing services, the packaging me methodology, uh, the infrastructure characteristics, locations of deployment, and on and on and on and on. And that's why that leads us to Cloud Foundry. I took the red pill. How many took the red pill? All right, good. It should be all of you. Uh, hopefully none of you took the red pill and then tried to throw it up. Um, but we are seeing, uh, uh, you know, a lot of benefits in terms of enterprise adoption. So these are the things, the attributes of the platform in terms of multi-cloud and containers and VMs, multi-language uh, support. What kind of got me excited about the platform was really around the infrastructure automation. And having been in mission-critical sy systems for decades, mission, business, life-critical environments, application environments, these things are critically important, you know, in terms of the automation capabilities. Um, and you saw in the previous presentation the ability to restart without human intervention. So these next three slides are what I presented at the summit last year. I might have stalled this one from somebody that 
It was very famous, but you can tweet it out that I said it. Um, but this dream was really about, hey, what if you could deploy and manage all IT applications and services on any cloud easily and consistently with the confidence that it meets all of your business objectives? And I went on to say, hey, you know, what if we had the capability to deal with not just 12-factor applications, but all workloads, right? 12-factor apps are great, but what about applications with state? You know, uh, what about uh, other types of workloads? And kind of thought about, hey, you know, what if we had these capabilities around persistence and data protection, you know, maybe even some data optimization or mobility and access capabilities uh, that were pluggable into the framework of, of the platform. So um, we actually put our money where our mouth is, and we've invested in a dojo. Uh, it's in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The bulk of our developers and contributors are, are there, and we've got uh, five folks in the San Francisco office um, on Howard Street. And so in a year, so last year, you know, that was kind of our dream. This year, here's how, how we've done over that period of time. We, we actually have been doing great in terms of meetups and, you know, uh, developing contributors. Uh, first Dojo announced in March of last year and over 1,900 uh, contributions to the open source. We went from nowhere nine months ago to number two in terms of open source contributions to the platform if, if you take uh, the pivotal contributors uh, out of that. And um, our focus is what I talked about earlier. It's to be able to deal with those things that your IT operators traditionally for years have, have to deal with in terms of business continuity, did, you know, data protection, you know, persistence, you know, all, all those things that are critical to the operations teams. So this is kind of our focus area. Um, specifically, what we've done within the past three years, or past year, is actually pretty significant. Uh, yesterday, there was a, a discussion by, with uh, Ted, Ted Young, Paul Warren, uh, the folks from IBM uh, around Diego Persistence, pre providing a persistence layer for the platform so we can deal with stateful applications. That architecture allows for pluggability of software-defined storage. We've got. A uh, demo we'll show you in a second uh, that allows Scale.io to underpin uh, this persistence layer. A lot of feedback from the community about, hey, can I deploy containers on bare metal? What about Cloud Foundry? Uh, earlier this year released a, a bare metal CPI allowing you to deploy your applications onto bare metal environments. Unique, we actually announced uh, that yesterday. We've been talking about it for uh, a month or so now. It's uh, the kind of think about next generation packaging technology, being able to get to more efficient footprint with lower uh, security threat uh, surface areas, if you will, and then other innovations around uh, uh, intelligent scheduling. So what I'd like to do now is uh, do a, bring up uh, Luke Woodchuck from our San Francisco uh, uh, team. So Luke is our development lead uh, from uh, San Francisco. Right. And Luke just had a baby six uh, weeks ago, so congratulations. Thank Luke. you. Just, just waking up, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he just rolled out of bed. Um, so you have a new baby, too. It's called Persistence. And uh, so this demo is going to show uh, the folks here about uh, Persistence on Scale.io. So exactly. uh, uh, that um, you know, capability. So, what's you know, what's a demo about? What, what's the type of app that you're, we're looking at? Uh, sure, we all love Cloud Foundry here, and and for the most part, twelve-factor apps are what we've been limited to in the past, right? We've now extended that so that you can take traditional apps onto Cloud Foundry. Um, and here's an example of one of those. Uh, it's a WordPress app, a blog that typically we see. And what's different about this app is that. The themes and the plugins that customize WordPress are actually stored on a file system. Okay, so this is the persistent data that's important for the, for the WordPress app. Yeah, exactly. So we took this WordPress app and we, we put it onto the platform. And you can use the CF apps command here to see uh, the EMC Dojo WordPress app. And now we're going to do the magic and scale it. Okay, so you're, you're scaling to what, five instances? Yeah, we've scaled to five instances here. Now, with WordPress, if you're familiar with it, if you do this uh, in a traditional case with Cloud Foundry, you lose that persistent data on all the replicants. Um, and we're going to show you that it exists 
Okay. Goes forward. All right. So in, in the normal case, we couldn't do this, right? So if you scaled the app in instances, those just instances could not maintain the state across the, the, uh, uh, the different instances of the app. Yeah, exactly. All subsequent instances would be vanilla WordPress. Okay. So we should see, as we bring up a separate browser window and navigate again to the site, an exact copy. But the difference here is that the instance index is different. That shows the server that it's being uh, delivered from. Okay. So we've scaled this with an exact replica, preserving the themes and the plugins. Okay, so maintaining the state between the different instances. So that's pretty cool, and it was pretty quick. It's, was it two lines of code? or? I think what's one of the best things about Cloud Foundry is right. we're trying to focus on the user interface and experience. There's so much complexity underneath the surface here, but it really boils down to a quick, easy command to do this. Yep, that's awesome. So uh, this was done in conjunction uh, EMC, IBM, and Pivotal up in San Francisco. Yep. Uh, definitely appreciate it. I'm sure a lot of our customers out here uh, will see the value in this. And uh, you know, it is, I think, one of the most significant um, you know, developments, if you will, that's uh, occurred recently with the platform. Yeah, for the first time ever, you're going to be able to take your legacy traditional apps and manage them in the same place that you manage your 12-factor apps. All right. Thank you, Luke. Get some sleep. Thank you. He's going to go back to bed. All right. So I am uh, about a minute off target, so I'll just kind of close uh, with this. Point you down to the booth. So to make it easier for developers, uh, we did launch a, a platform called Native Hybrid Cloud allowing you to deploy applications, whether it be on-prem or off-prem, um, and do that in a very simplistic way with tools sitting on top around CI, CD, application performance management, the build back and show back capabilities, as well as additional analytics. So to close, um, we see this movement really uh, accelerating digital transformation across the globe. Uh, you have made the right choice. If you're here uh, around Cloud Foundry, it is by far the best platform on the planet. Our job as a community is to continue to enhance and enrich that without de uh, t detracting from the abstraction or the, simple, you know, the simple way in which you can uh, build and deploy uh, applications. Um, the world will be you know, kind of uh, very heterogeneous in terms of VMs and containers. It will be multi-cloud. Um, you know, pass and open source are critical uh, purchasing requirements. Cloud Foundry is by far the best first and only choice, allowing our customers, you uh, in the audience here, to keep the balance between innovation velocity and business requirements. So thank you, and have a great rest of the show.